This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back and thanks for tuning in. My guest today is Doug Chabot, director of the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center. Our job is all winter long is we give easy to remember, easy to digest information about the snow and avalanches so recreationists can go out and have fun. Doug is a prototypical man of the mountains. He's put up new climbing routes all over the world, been arrested by border guards in Tajikistan, rescued countless stranded mountain travelers, and built an incredible team and invaluable community resource at the Abbey Center. With winter fast approaching, we wanted to catch up with Doug about his approach to decision-making in the mountains and how anyone interested in traveling on the snow can do so more responsibly. Doug, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Justin, thanks for having me. So tell us where you grew up and what did your parents do? I, I can't believe you're going to make me admit this, but uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey. Uh, yeah, I knew the, that. Which exit kinda, in New yeah, Jersey? <laughs> actually, it was exit 12. It's the uh, it's the it's kind of the bad part. It's uh, right around Elizabeth, uh, Newark Airport area. And let's see, mom was a special ed uh, school teacher in grammar school, and my dad worked f- um, at Newark Airport for Eastern Airlines. So when they were a thing, you know, a while ago. Yeah. A while ago. And you had the good sense to get out of Jersey and go to Prescott College. How did you make that choice? Yeah. Growing up in Jersey was pretty, you know, I mean, it was wonderful on one level, but uh, I, ever since I was little, I knew I wanted to leave. And, uh, and I had this idea that I wanted to do something in the outdoors. And uh, my senior year in high school, I saved all my money bussing tables at a restaurant. And uh, I took an adventure out West to do a 30 day survival course in Colorado, which was kind of crazy. Um, Cause I'd never, I'd never slept out at all. I'd never done anything really outdoors, but I just thought this is for me for some crazy reason. And, uh, and it worked. And after that, I ended up at Prescott college which has a strong outdoor program and graduated in wilderness leadership, a BA degree, and have been pretty much dedicated to work in the outdoors ever since. Yeah. You made your way to Montana to ski patrol. Um, yes. Tell us about that uh, journey. How did you end up here? A girl following a girl and uh, got me here. And, you know, I didn't know how to ski. So that's a problem if you want to be a ski patroller. Yeah. So I, I did what a lot of people do, which is I worked at a restaurant at Iscaria. So I worked, I started at Big Sky, then I ended up at Bridger. While I was working as a bartender and a busser, you know, bussing tables and stuff, I uh, would get a free ski pass and I learned how to ski. And then I just begged and begged and begged the ski patrol, let me try out. It barely worked. I think to this day, I was probably the worst skier ever on the Bridger Bowl Ski Patrol. But I had other skills. I was a climber at the time, and I at least could handle being out in the mountains and not killing myself or anyone else. Yeah. And so some amazing mountain adventures, first ascents all over the world. Tell us a little bit about you know what drew you to, to getting into the big mountains. It was getting a taste of a big mountain and, and seeing that I had a bit of an affinity for it. I wasn't the strongest rock climber. I wasn't the strongest ice climber, but I found out I had this ability to suffer, which, and, and a short-term memory, you know, and those two things are, <laughs> are great for alpinists because it means you can, you can climb hard enough in bigger mountains for weeks on end. And, you know, Alaska was where I started. I started guiding trips on Denali uh, and then doing personal trips there. And that's where I really learned how to Alpine climb was Alaska mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and doing hard routes up there and some new routes. And then that led to uh, going to Pakistan in 2000 with climbing partner Jack Tackle. And we tried a peak called the Ogre. And pretty much once I went to Pakistan, I thought, yep, this is, this is for me. And yeah. <laughs> I've gone most summers since then. Uh, I think I've been on like 12 climbing expeditions there. And I just kept going back. Like a lot of things in life, you know, you you win some, you lose some. We wouldn't always summit every single peak. You know, every time we tried, sometimes it would take multiple attempts, but every now and then you get a win and you, you, you're, you're climbing an unclimbed peak or a new route on a peak in the Karakoram of Pakistan, you know, on these, and it's just, 
absolutely unbelievable. And Annette certainly fell in love with the country. And But that got me going. Guiding and then climbing in the summers on these big expeditions uh, kind of were a major foundation for the work I'm doing as an, at the Avalanche Center as well. Yeah, we'll pivot to the Avalanche Center in a moment, but but you know, you mentioned you keep going back, but you also keep coming back. What do you think are some of the uh, secrets to your longevity and in, in making it back safely? Luck, luck is understated sometimes. I mean, yeah, yeah. there's not a lot of reasons why I'm here and other people are not. You know, um, and other than I, I got lucky on a few times, um, and also. I've been incredibly careful about picking really good partners. Um, and right. so I climb with people that I fully, fully trust. I don't climb on expeditions with people I don't know. Um, and you're just building this really tight relationship with these small teams. And I think that really has a, a lot to do with it. Yeah, I was always drawn to kind of the public safety uh, side of things uh, with search and rescue. You know, with my climbing, I was in the big mountains where avalanches were a a huge risk, um, and so I was always trying to learn more. I took a few avalanche classes and really liked them. I was really drawn to the science aspect of it, and I really, it's it's a neat thing where, yes, you have science, but you also, you kind of have to walk the talk. Like, you know, you're going to make a decision based on some data you collected, but then you're going to go out and it better work, you know, because you're going to pay the price if it doesn't. And I, mm-hmm. I kind of liked that, um, that aspect of it. And, you know, I was given an opportunity in 1995 to work here on the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center uh, part time, and that grew into something more. And I enjoyed helping people out. I enjoyed letting sure. people know what they could do, you know, to, to be safe out there. So let's describe, just for listeners not familiar with the Avalanche Center, describe kind of the the purview of the center. What it is it that you all do? Our job is all winter long is we give easy to remember, easy to digest information about the snow and avalanches so recreationists can go out and have fun. And, mm-hmm. you know, we do that every morning by 730 with an avalanche advisory. It's about 500 words uh, you can read. And we tell you things like, how much did it snow? Where did it snow? Were there any avalanches that came down? If you're going to go out today, what should you expect? You know, is it, is it really dangerous where maybe it's a good idea to stay at home or is it not so bad? And, you, you know, today's a good day to go out and have fun. So we help people make these decisions to keep them alive. And, uh, and it works. What we can do that other people can't is, you know, we're out in the field. One of us is in the field most days of the week with a partner. And so we're gathering information. We're digging holes in the snow. We're looking at the layering. We're seeing if the snowpack is getting stronger or weaker. We're reporting on that. We're also kind of this filter for all this other avalanche information that comes in throughout Southwest Montana. And then we can distill that and give you the information like, oh, there was a big avalanche down by Cook City or um, smaller avalanches at the ridgetops and the bridgers from the wind. And we'll tell you what to look for, um, where these instabilities are. So we're just kind of this clearing house of all this information. And then we package it every day into something that you can remember and ideally be helpful when you go out there. And so how do you approach that work yourself? I mean, you've got this deep history as as someone who's had to make consequential decisions in the mountains yourself, yet you can't necessarily generalize from your own experience to the experience that others might face. But that experience, like you said, you have to sort of be able to walk the talk. How do you kind of think about distilling signal from noise in such a way that would be useful for you, but also useful for others? Not all information and data is created equal. You know, so an example is, you know, one of the small things we do is people send us observations. They'll say, let's say, Justin, you were out skiing yesterday. That You'd write in and say, I found this and I dug this. And, you know, we we might weight that more or less depending on if we know you, if you're giving mm-hmm. reliable info. Um As an avalanche forecast center, we give information for mountain ranges. Like we're dealing with big zones. And so we give a very broad brush 
um, you know, picture of what you can expect, you know, so we might say something like, Hey, it snowed, um, 14 to 18 inches. The winds are blowing 20 miles an hour. We know there were wind slabs that form. We know that there were avalanches at the ridge tops. That's where you should be the most careful. Now, when you go out that day, you're less concerned about what's happening in the mountain range. And you're more worried about well, what's happening right now, like on this slope that I want to go ski. And ideally, we've given you enough information to where we're going to tell you what to look for. You know, we would have said, hey, you need to look at these wind loads or there's a weak layer two feet under your feet that you should be digging for. So we're going to tell you what to look for and how to go about doing that. Because where people get confused and what is difficult is interpreting your own results because it's not always clean. It's not always black and white. If there's avalanches everywhere, it's pretty easy. You're like, oh, pretty dangerous today. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> you know, and the same if, if it hasn't snowed in a week and there's no avalanches, you're feeling pretty good. But most of the time, it's somewhere in between. With education, we try and help you make better decisions, you know, when you're, when you're out in the field. If you find instability, if you find something bad or you see something dangerous, like you just, you just watched an avalanche happen, maybe you triggered it from afar, or you see an avalanche that happened a day ago. Mm -hmm. um, it looks recent. Like you don't have to dig a snow pit. You don't, you don't have to do anything fancy with the snow to figure out if it's strong or not. Mother nature just told you that she's just giving you this information and just pay attention to that and go somewhere else. Like don't, don't ski in steep terrain that day. It's knowing what to look for, but we tend to throw that out. It's kind of funny when we're in the field, it's, it's easy to forget that, Hey, it's, it's not, you don't need a master's degree here. Like a mm -hmm. lot of the clues are right in front of us and we just have to know what to look for. Yeah. And, and, and some of what you're, some of the subtext of what you're mentioning there sounds like some of the human factors, right? Like yes. we enter these days with our own agendas and our own objectives right. and preconceived notions of, of what we might find. Um, yep. Talk about that, how human psychology gets into the picture here. Yeah, well, you know, human, we're human. And uh, it doesn't matter what we do, we're always kind of tilting things one way or the other, or, you know, right. we, we spin it in the best light possible for ourselves. I mean, that's normal. But at the same time, in something like trying to predict avalanches or trying to determine if a slope is safe or not, we have to be really, really careful because our own biases start to show up that can end up killing us. Over the decades now I've been working, you know, when we look at these avalanche accidents, a lot of the same thing keeps popping up. And, you know, one of the big ones we see is failure of recognizing that you are in avalanche train. That's one. Right. And that's relatively easy. If you carry a little $20 inclinometer with you and you practice with it, you get really good at determining if the slope you're on is avalanche train or not, because it's all about how steep is it. Mm -hmm. um, and people fail to do that. Another thing that happens a lot is, you know, you have your favorite spot. We'll say you, you're a backcountry skier and there's like three spots that you go to or four spots consistently all winter long, year after year after year. You start to get this familiarity with the terrain and the, and the snow there and you start to think that you know more than you do. And you start to believe like, hey, I was just here last week. I've been skiing here for eight years and I've never seen this hill slide. And all of a sudden the hill slides and you're like, well, a lot changed over the last six days when you weren't here. One, two is eight years feels like a long time to you, but in terms of avalanches and avalanche cycles, it's nothing. Those are the kind of the biases and the human factor things we, we fail to recognize our failures. Yeah. I think too, like one of the things, and just because you have a successful day in the mountains doesn't mean you made the right choice. Right. I mean, the fact that an avalanche didn't happen is not evidence that it can't happen. It's another common error you bring up, which is, you know, uh, uh, not having it, not having an avalanche doesn't go into the positive column of like you were right. Yeah, you know? exactly. I mean, there's tons of analogies we can use where, you know, it works, you know, but you, if, if you consistently do that, it, it's you, you're upping the odds that it's not going to work. We'll be back to my conversation with Doug Chabot after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. 
Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. I'm Maureen Dowd of the New York Times, and you're listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. I'm speaking with avalanche forecaster Doug Chabot about safe travel in snowy mountains. I'd love to talk about um, the things that a lot of users of the information that your center produces are the incident reports. You know, mm-hmm. when something goes wrong, your reports, I think, are, are particularly instructive in terms of deconstructing the accident, um, providing an account of what happened, but also some knowledge that users could potentially apply to future situations to make better decisions. How do you approach that work, those investigations? And also, you know, when there's a fatality involved, it's it's got to be a pretty heavy experience to kind of navigate how to tell that story um, in a way that resonates, but it's all, also a way that's true to the facts. Yeah, that's a it, it's a fine line where, wa- where we walk there, um, especially it's not uncommon for us to either know the person that died or know of them. They've been a member of the community or, you know, I mean, and so these are incredibly sensitive. What we try and do, we state just the facts and we try not to editorialize too much. So an example would be the victim didn't have an avalanche transceiver or the rescuer, their batteries died, or both people were in avalanche terrain because they were both caught. You know, so it's a little bit of read between the lines, Um, you know, instead of saying like, we can't believe they were out there two at a time on the slope. Like, that's crazy. Like, we don't do that. Um, We just want to state what exactly happened. We also, a part of those accident reports um, are the photos and the videos. Over the last, I don't know, probably close to 15 years now, every accident we investigate, we make a video on the scene. And those are heavy, 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 um, because yeah. you're at the scene, either the, either you were there to help with the body recovery or the potential rescue, or we might be there the next day doing a, a, an investigation of the site. And there's the, the hole in the snow where they dug the person up. We might know them. We can see the tree they hit that killed them. You know, I mean, it's pretty serious stuff. You want the audience to know what happened. You know, you don't want to withhold anything. Don't say that he hit the tree. We learn from viewing it and seeing it. And that's the power of the videos. And so in my head and with a way I frame it before we start filming is, hey, like we're making this movie for whoever this person's mom is. Like, let's just picture mom. She doesn't know about backcountry skiing or, you know, she just knows like, He just went out today to go skiing and here he is dead. What happened? How could it be? You're talking to her in my mind, like this is what happened. And just to try and explain it non-judgmentally. And I find that helps, you know, for the tone and for getting the information too. Because part of our job with the forecasts, with these videos, with the reports, is making sure whatever we write or say doesn't require a level of of avalanche expertise and jargon that we just want to make sure what we're saying can be understood to everyone. Yeah, I think that's well put. And speaking of that, I mean, we've seen even before COVID, we were seeing pretty extensive growth in, you know, backcountry skiing, snowmobiling, people traveling on snow outside of ski areas. Um, and then COVID just kind of accelerated that like it has done most things. Um, Talk about that influx of new travelers into the backcountry and how that's maybe influenced the work of the center. That was quite remarkable. Um, We're still on that wave as far as I can tell. Um, You know, when COVID hit, snowmobiles sold all their inventory. Ski shops were out of all backcountry gear. This is throughout the Mm -hmm. West. This isn't just like here in Montana. And there was a huge hunger, which I love. I, th- I think it's kind of cool. Like people were like, okay, pandemic. I don't know where they got all the money from, but you know, cause these are expensive toys, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but people were like, hey, like we want to be outside. What a great yeah. opportunity to engage, you know, and, and being outdoors and getting healthy. So the next year we, we kind of geared up, which was last winter for a huge influx in people. And it happened, it happened all throughout the West. You know, it's not like we had trail counters out there counting people, but it was, was so obvious if you've been out before, like you could no longer, if you didn't get there early, you couldn't find a parking spot at a trailhead. Or if you skied out or snowmobiled out somewhere, there were just a lot of people first like mile or so of the trailhead. 
certainly the further back you went, the less people there were. And there were more people kind of punching further, you know, away from the trailhead than we've seen before. But nationally, what was really interesting is the avalanche professional community, we were geared up for a really bad winter, which it was. We set a record. I think there were 37 yeah. fatalities. But we all were guessing that the people that were going to get injured and the people that were going to die were going to be all these brand new users. They're the ones that we need to be worried about. And when we look back at last year, the opposite is what happened. Um, people with much more experience. The average age of the fatalities last year, those 37, was something in their mid-40s. And it was almost 10 years older than the 10-year average before that. So there was a lot more older people out there. It wasn't brand new people. These were very experienced people. But it was also when you add crowds, you're venturing farther out. Sure. I, I think we'll see a bigger bump in our numbers, even of people taking classes. We've got about 40 instructors. Our, our friends of the Avalanche Center helps us teach. They'll be busy this year running all sorts of Avalanche classes. And so in the years that you've been doing this, I mean, climate change has had to have affected the snowpack. How has it affected forecasting? Have avalanches become more or less difficult to predict uh, given climate change? How has climate change manifested in, in its effects in your work? That's something that's being studied pretty hard right now. You know, so first off, I think it's really important for people to understand that weather and climate are two different things. You know, weather is the architect of avalanches. And so, you know, the weather that we're having this week right now will affect the foundation of our snowpack. Now, when we look at climate, bigger picture of, of what's happening, we're seeing changes in Montana, which are noticeable. And an example, what we're seeing is we're seeing these storms that come are bigger and, you know, so we'd get bigger storms with longer periods of maybe no storms in between. Spring is coming a few weeks early now than sure. it, you know, used to. One of the more noticeable, this is anecdotal for me, having been here for over 30 years, is rain. And so even though we're getting precipitation in the middle of the winter, it is not uncommon to get a rainstorm or two. We'll see rain at lower elevations in the fall here, which is a bit of a problem for recreation because if you want a snowmobile, or you want to ski out of a trailhead, even though the snow's up high, if it's been raining down low, there's not going to be much of a base for you to get in there. And so that's a, right. that's a problem. And then we're seeing in the spring rain when, it, when normally previous history, you know, we would have had snow. It's coming in as rain and rain on snow really chews up, you know, the snow pretty quickly. And so now we end up with mud um, in March instead of, <laughs> instead of right. snow. But in terms of forecasting and in terms of like you as a skier, me as a skier, the rules are the same. Like how we go about determining if today is good or not good, we use the same tools we you sure. know, that we've always used. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So in our remaining time, Doug, I just want to pivot the conversation and give you a chance to talk about some of the great work that you and your colleagues do in the Middle East and Pakistan with the Urca Fund. Tell us about the Urca Fund and what you all are up to. Like I said earlier, you know, my climbing brought me to Pakistan in 2000. And so through all these climbing expeditions, I made a lot of friends and you know, also saw the need uh, for some basic education for girls overseas. Mm -hmm. And I was volunteering with uh, Central Asia Institute at the time, which was based in Bozeman. The interest kept growing. My wife at the time, Genevieve, she got her doctorate in education and she was very interested in what was happening in Pakistan. She'd also worked in Africa. In 2011, we decided that we would start a nonprofit, ICRA fund. ICRA means to read in, in Arabic. And the goal is to get girls to school. The mission was to remove barriers to education. You know, it wasn't necessarily to build the, you know, mortar bricks, you know, buildings as much as it was to make sure that opportunities existed. And that meant removing the financial barriers for girls, you know, making sure that the um, a father could afford uh, a uniform, school books, you know, we would take care of that. And then teachers, you know, because if we're going to add girls to a school that didn't have girls before, we need teachers. For about $170 a year per student, we can get a girl to primary school, which takes her to seventh grade. What's true the world over, it doesn't matter whether it's, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, Afghanistan, Pakistan. If you get a girl to 
seventh grade, a lot of really good things happen. She's literate. Her kids are also more apt to go to school. Uh, maternal and infant mortality rates uh, plummet. So moms are living in childbirth, during childbirth, and the, the kids are living. There's a host of great things that come just from seventh grade. If they want to continue on in the high school, we'll provide that. As long as they have support from their family, we will keep scholarshipping them um, all the way into college. And we've actually hired some that started as grammar school students for us in 2011 that are now teaching. We have over 5,000 Kids going to school, we've got about 2,000 boys, 3,000 girls, because we also help out communities that where the boys can't go to school either. There's always the hook that um, if we're going to help boys, we have to get the girls there too. Where would you point listeners who want to learn more about their ICRA fund? Where would you point them? I would send them to the website, which is ICRA, I-Q-R-A, fund.org, and it has all the latest information. And uh, yeah, we're, I'm real proud of that. It, it's amazing. As you should be. As we close, Doug, so one, thank you for the work that you and your team do. Uh, as a consumer of it, uh, I am I am grateful. You know, I know many in our listener audience are as well. You do a lot of things to get people the message, but also there's ways in which the public can support the Avalanche Centers, the, you know, the Gallatin Avalanche Center, but also the Missoula Avalanche Centers. How can folks learn more about pitching in to help out the centers? So the, the easiest way is every Avalanche Center has a website. And to go to your local Avalanche Center website and avalanche.org um, is, is the national database for all these Avalanche Centers. And so if you click on the center nearest you, usually a donate tab there, um, and every Avalanche Center has a nonprofit arm called the Friends Group, and they help fundraise right. in the community. So we have a Friends of the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center that fundraise in Southwest Montana to support education and our our operation here uh, along with the forest. They partner with the Forest Service to make this happen. Yeah. So somebody might ask like, hey, you're a Forest Service entity. Yeah. Why do you need this nonprofit? Why do you need this supplemental support? Well, yeah. well, how do Why do we need to fill the gap? So our funding is uh, we are very well supported by our Forest Service uh, here on the Gallatin and about 50, 52% of our total uh, budget comes from the Forest Service, but we have needs for four forecasters and as well as the snow machines and all the education we do, and we need outside help. It allows us to grow and to be as robust as we can by having a partner that is not confined in their fundraising efforts and that are there to help us specifically with our mission. So that's why they exist, and it's a great way to support us is through our partnership with the Friends of the Avalanche Center. Very good. Last question, Doug. If you could just sort of guarantee that one thing got across to the listener today, what would that one message be? Get an avalanche forecast from your local forecast center before you go out. They're going to tell you what to look for. We're paid to, to give you good information so you can be safe out there. Awesome. Doug Chabot, thanks for being with us today. Justin, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. AJ Williams is our producer, BTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott. And Jeff Meese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.